All right, good morning. Let me ask you to stand one more time, if you would. My wife and I just returned from um, a quick trip to Nevada, or Nevada, however you say it. Our daughter lives there. We're visiting her and three of our grandkids. And um, I don't know if you've ever been to Fallon, Nevada, but I encourage you not to go. (laughs) It's just a little bitty town with some tiny little uh, stores and but we went to Reno, and one of the cool things in Reno was uh, this antique car museum. I used to have an old 66 uh, Carmagia, if you know what that is. And so went into this museum and had everything from a Model T up to the cool cars of the 60s. And, of course, everything from a Model T to the cars in the 60s are the best cars they've ever made, right? I mean, <laughs> now everything looks the same. But anyway, Harara, whoever he is who had casinos and hotels, collected antique cars. So he had 1,400 antique cars in this museum. So we went with our grandkids. We walked all around, very impressed, go back to Fallon, and they had just built a new Arby's there. (laughs) And so we walk into Arby's with our five-year-old grandson, and he walks to the middle of Arby's, puts his hands up like this, and goes, this is Arby's. Wow, we're we're, we're impressed. So anyway, that's where we've been. We're in Revelation chapter 20, but let's pray. Lord, thank you for every person who's here today. And thank you for the fact that you promised us that wherever two or three would gather in your name, there you would be right in the midst of us. So Lord, thank you for being here. And would you move among us and speak to us? There's hearts here who are struggling. There's hearts here that are hurting. There's hearts here that are rejoicing. And Lord, you know every, of, every one of them very well. So use your word, your spirit to speak to us today. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Grab a seat if you would. Turn in your Bible, if you have one with you, to Revelation chapter 20. We've been out of Revelation through the Christmas season and New Year's, and now we're stepping back in. Revelation chapter 20. There was a man who lived in the 19th century, a great French novelist. His name was Victor Hugo. He wrote that great novel, Les Miserables. I don't know if I'm saying the word right. It's, I, lo- I looked it up on YouTube, and some French guy was pronouncing it in French and in English, and I still don't know how to pronounce it. But you know probably the novel. And Hugo, he, he penned these words about the 20th century. Here's what he said. He said, in the 20th century, war will cease. Hatred will cease, there'll be no dogmas, no boundaries, and man will possess something higher, and man will possess something greater. He'll possess a great country, and he called that country the whole earth, that everyone would be kind of one at that time in the 20th century. He will possess a great hope together in his heart, a hope of heaven. Well, today we're 23 years into the 21st century. And war rages in Russia, the Ukraine, North Korea threatens, Iran is still working on a nuclear power that Israel is very opposed to, division, violence, hatred seem to be on the increase across the world. Everyone has kind of stepped back in shock at those students who were killed in Idaho and those kind of stories, well, they, they go on and on and on, it seems, in our world, in our nation. But I think these words of Hugo kind of reflect, if you will, what's deep in mankind's heart. That all of us desire that one day, someday, some way on earth, there would be peace, there'd be safety, 
There would be equity of wealth and prosperity. And as we've studied in the book of Revelation, we, we see the promise of what's to come. Here in chapter 20, as the Lord has returned in a mighty way in 19, in chapter 19, we, we find these verses in the first three. It says, I saw an angel coming down from heaven. This would be John, the apostle who wrote this book as he was there, isolated on the island of Patmos. He says, I, I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him so he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. In these verses, you, you see this term, thousand years. It appears six times in the, this chapter 20. It speaks of a time that is known as the millennium, the millennium of peace that will come upon the earth. And as we enter this topic, the, the subject of the millennium, a, a thousand-year reign of Christ, I, I want to make a few qualifying statements, if I can. There are several theological positions about this passage, about this period of time. There's one called post-millennialism, there's premillennialism, there's amillennialism, and the millennial reign is, is, is an obvious biblical subject. There's, there's three theological kind of stances, if you will. But I would call this subject not an essential our foundational doctrine of Christian faith. So, so stay with me, listen. There are some essentials, are some foundational, non-negotiable kind of foundations of our faith, like the Trinity, the deity of Christ, the virgin birth, the resurrection, the substitutionary death of Jesus on the cross. Those are like foundational parts of our faith that are non-negotiable. But, but the subject of this millennial reign, I think there's room for discussion and disagreement without undermining or separating people from the Christian fellowship. Would you agree with that? The bottom line is this. Christ is coming back to rule and reign but, but how the details fall into place continue to be debated and challenged. And you've got these three different viewpoints. Amillennialism, that the thousand-year kingdom, this is what that group believes, is symbolic. It represents the church here on earth. It's not a literal reigning of Christ. It's a spiritual thing, not a material thing. So that's one view. There's postmillennial. They believe Christ returns after the thousand years, and that the church will usher in the thousand years through, through preaching, through evangelism, through Christian politics, and that much of the world will be saved, making the world almost completely Christian, and the world gets better and better and better until Jesus returns. Good luck with that one. Uh, Premillennial. Jesus Christ will return. Just before the thousand years beginning, Christ literally returns to earth at the end of the tribulation period and will rule and reign on earth for a thousand years. Then I saw an angel, verse 1, coming down from heaven, having a key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand, and he laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil, Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. The first thing we see in this chapter is the removal and binding of Satan. And he uses several terms for him. Satan, dragon, serpent, the devil. And, and it's implying here no more unrighteousness on earth. No more denial of God or 
cursing his name. No more war or murder or sickness or disease or pain or suffering. Here, Scripture describes the enemy with these names. The first one is dragon, a spiritual power that's fiery and cruel and brutal and stirs up passions and, and in, in people's hearts and in governments and gangs, causes them to act like beasts, monsters to destroy people's lives. He's a dragon. The, the old serpent, a spiritual power to deceive, to seduce, and lead people to disobey, ignore, and neglect God and his truth. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, it says, No wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself to an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. He, he, he's deceptive. And in Genesis, I'll, I'll read this, this verse for you. I'm sure you're very familiar with it. In Genesis chapter 3, at the very beginning, it says, uh, the serpent, there's that name that's used for Satan, was more cunning than any other beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, he begins this, this questioning of God's truth and his character. And he says, has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said, well, there's one. And he, and he says, but the fruit in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat. And then the serpent said, oh, oh, no, no, you'll not die. And so you've got this picture of a deceiver. You've got this fiery dragon. You've also got the word, the devil, a spiritual power that slanders and lies and murders by leading people to lie and murder and slander. In John chapter 8, verse 44, it, it mentions this, you are the father you are of your father, there's this word, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. And then it describes who the devil is. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there's no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he's a liar and the father of it. Has the enemy ever lied to you? And then there's the word Satan the one who accuses or opposes and condemns in Revelation chapter 12, verse 10. We, we saw that verse, then I heard a loud voice, now salvation, strength, and the kingdom of our God, and the powers before the accuser of our brethren, who has accused them before our God day and night, has been cast down. Now, the removal of Satan or the devil or the serpent or the dragon here in chapter 20, is, is very obvious there in verse 3. It cast him into the bottomless pit, shut him up, and set a seal on him so he should deceive the nations no more. To keep him from deceiving. That's what he's done since the garden, as God said. That's what he did to create the fall questioning God and, and having you or, or, or mankind question God's character, question God's truth. And, and very, you know, from the very beginning since the garden, he has done that. He, he's, he's seduced, he's lied, he's deceived. And he deceives with all kinds of things. He deceives with lust. He deceives people with drugs and power and greed. He, he, he deceives people with the true purpose and the value of life. What's the purpose of my life, and what do I value? And the deception will, will cease here. He's bound in the abyss for a thousand years. And those are the opening three verses. And then it says, and I saw thrones, verse 4. And they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witnesses to Jesus and for the word of God who did not worship the beast or his image, had not received the mark on their foreheads or on their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This was the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who...
first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, and they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him again for a thousand years. John sees thrones and people sitting on these thrones who are giving authority to judge. So obviously you think, well, who, who are these people who, who are judging? Well, it could be, we, we saw in Matthew chapter 19, Jesus said to his apostles, I say to you that in regeneration, when the Son of Man sits on the throne of his glory, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. So, so, so we know it's possibly the, the apostles. We also have... Uh, Revelation chapter 2, verse 26, And he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. There's also, I, I believe, a, a, a group, that's, that's the first group that, that's mentioned. There's also another group of people who, who will uh, rule and, and reign and, and be given authority and it's uh, here in Revelation chapter 20, verse 5. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. But he talks about those who, who were beheaded, who had not worshipped the beast, and that lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years, the martyrs of the, the tribulation. And then there's a third group mentioned in these passages here. And it's the unbelieving dead. Not that they'll reign and rule, but they will appear before the great white throne. And those who reign with Christ are of the first resurrection during this chapter. So the group's reigning, the group's judging, the martyrs, the apostles, and then these unbelieving who are still in the graves. The others have been resurrected. And, and Satan's incarcerated. There's no evil on the earth. And we can all together at that time sing with Louis Armstrong, what a wonderful world. What a, no, I'm not going to go there. <laughs> <laughs> what a wonderful world. There's, there's peace. There's no war. I, I want to read a, a few passages from the great prophet Isaiah who talks about this time over and over again when there'll be peace, when there'll be great uh, ruler and leadership of the Lord. And in Isaiah chapter 2, I'll just read a few verses. It says this, The word that Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem, it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains, and he shall be exalted above the hills. And all the nations, all the nations shall flow to it. And many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, the house of God, the God of Jacob, and he will teach us his ways, and we shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, out of the word of the Lord from Jerusalem, and he will judge between nations and rebuke many people. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. There'll come a time on earth during this millennial reign where there'll be no war. It'll be peace. You know, today there's peace marches. There's peace demonstrations. There's the, if you're from the 60s, there's the peace sign. There's Nobel Peace Prizes. There's peace treaties. But the only thing that's really missing is peace. <laughs> We've got all these things, but no peace. This is a time of worldwide peace and lots of other amazing things that are described by the prophet Isaiah. In fact, listen to this from Isaiah chapter 11. I'll start in verse 6. This is an interesting passage, and this describes the time of the millennial reign here in Revelation chapter 20. It says, The wolf shall dwell with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the young goat. 
the calf and the young lion and the fatling together. And a little child shall lead them, the cow and the bear shall graze. Their young ones will lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like an ox. The nursing child shall play by the cobra's hole, and a weaned child shall put his hand in the viper's den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. So there's this great time of amazing peace, and also there's this great time of, of peace between the animals. And, and it says here, the wolf and the lamb would lie down together. Today, if a wolf and the lamb lie down together, the wolf would get up. But I'm not so sure the lamb would be getting up. There's the leopard and the goat. A, a children playing with snakes and they don't hurt them. Didn't say anything about the child not hurting the snake because children can get pretty rough. But there's this time of, of amazing peace, even in the animal domain. I don't know how many, how many of you have ever heard of the, the bird, the emu? I've got a picture of an emu here. It's not an ostrich. It's an emu. And they're predominantly in Australia. And they're, they're huge. They're, they're the second largest bird on the planet next to the ostrich. And one time I was, I was in Australia. I was with a, a friend named Ricky Ryan. I think a guy named Britt Merrick was with us. And, and a friend of mine, Ray Bentley, who passed away uh, last year. Uh, I had the privilege of doing his funeral. Great friend from San Diego. And we were all in Australia doing a conference on the Gold Coast. And we went to a little petting zoo in Australia where they had little kangaroos. I don't know why I'm doing that. But <laughs> little, little, <laughs> little kangaroos were bouncing around. And you could pet them. You could pet these kangaroos. And, and there, there, was, there was an emu, emus there, koala bears. And, and Ray had just had some shoulder surgery. And he had, on, he had to wear sometimes during the day this little thing on his arm to keep, a sling to keep his arm from hurting. And so we're walking around, we're petting these, and this emu, for some reason, saw Ray. And he's like, I don't know if he saw his sling, he thought, oh, he's weak. And <laughs> next thing we know, he's coming up to Ray, and we're sort of all in different areas, but we're close to one another, and he's, and he's kind of pecking on Ray. And, and Ray lifted up his hand to stop him. When he did, it hurt his, hit his shoulder so much, he went down on his knees, and the emu just went after him. He's like, <laughs> and so, so Ricky and, and Brett and I, we're standing there, and we're just laughing. <laughs> and, his, and, his, and his wife is going, help him, help him. We're going, no, we're not. I mean, guys don't, guys like that kind of stuff. We're like, <laughs> so, so I say all that and say this, emus won't attack you during the millennial <laughs> reign. There's also, let, let, me, let me go on. In Isaiah chapter 35, there's also, a, a, it mentions here, kind of a, a new ecological system that's going to be on the earth during that time. In, in Isaiah chapter uh, 35, it, it says this, The wilderness and the wasteland will be glad, and the desert shall rejoice and blossom as a rose. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice. Even the joy in singing the glory of Lebanon shall be given to it. The excellence of Carmel and Sharon, they shall see the glory of the excellence of the Lord. There'll be this, this great ecological times where even the deserts will bloom, the flowers. There'll, there'll be no more weeds in northwest Florida. I mean, imagine. No more mole crickets. No, none of that. It's insane. Flowers would actually grow in our area, and there'd be no more demonic mosquitoes living near your house. <laughs> There'll be healing of, of disabilities, it talks about in Scripture. It's, it's, a, it's in, in Isaiah, and this will probably be my last verse in Isaiah chapter 65. Listen to what it says. It says, For behold, I create a new heaven and a new earth, 
and the former shall not be remembered or come to mind. Be, be glad and rejoice forever in what I create. For behold, I'll create Jerusalem as a rejoicing in her people. I rejoice in Jerusalem. Enjoy my people. The voice of weeping shall no longer be heard, nor the voice of crying. An amazing time. No more shall an infant from there live but a few days. No more crib death. No more infant deaths or stillborns, which is a horrible thing that people go through. I'll never forget one time I was called to a hospital. This couple had been attending our church. They had just uh, been here for a few weeks, and they, they had their first child. And they had just come out of the Catholic church and were just new to the church trying to figure it all out. And I got this phone call one night from, from the hospital say, there's a couple here, says you're their pastor, they want you to come. And she began to describe the situation to me, and I'll never, ever forget this. I, I get to the hospital, and it's a Baptist hospital, and I walk in, and the nurse says, uh, thank you so much for coming. Uh, the baby was born, stillborn, and the mother will not give us the baby. She's holding on to it. And I said, so you want me to help you? She said, could you? I said, well, I'll, I'll try. So I go in, and there's this, it's not really a recognizable child, but she has it. And I walk in, and we're talking, and, you know, we're praying, and it's just a tense situation, and the nurses are all out in the hall. I think they're listening. And I said, um, you know, I'm so sorry, and we prayed. And I, and I said, well, you know, the, the nurse really wants to take the child. And I didn't know if she was, like, you know, thinking the baby was alive or what, but it was very obvious it was not. And they, they were adamant that, no, we, we want the child baptized. We want the child baptized before we give it up. And so I, w I said, well, I'll be right back. So I went out and I said, they, they want, do, can you bring me a pan of water or something? They said, sure, yeah. So I went back in. I, she gave me the child and you know, I sprinkled the child and baptized it that way. I mean, I wasn't going to immerse it, so I sprinkled it and uh, and then we prayed, and then I said, you know, now uh, the nurses really need to uh, do some testing and things for the child. And so they said, oh, yes, please. And so off, off they went. But th there'll never be that kind of experience again in, in the millennial reign. No, no child, it says here, no more shall an infant from there live but a few days. Then it says this, nor an old man who has not fulfilled his days, for the child shall die 100 years old. So if you're 100 years old, it's, it'd be like a child dying. How cool is that? You say, how old were you? How old are you? I'm, I'm about 100. Oh, you're like a kid. That, that's what it's basically saying. You say, well, John, why the millennial reign? Why this thousand years? I mean, why not just go straight to heaven? You know, like Monopoly, don't collect 200, you know, just go straight there. Why, why not that? What, what, what's going on with this? Well, there, there's a couple of things I think that make biblical sense here. One is that God redeems creation from the curse since the garden. He brings it back. He promised that. During the tribulation time, Prior to this, the, the earth is going to be decimated. You, you, you heard, you saw all the things that happened. And God restores it. It's also, in, in some ways, some simple ways, a, a powerful answer to the million and millions of prayers that have gone up to God that, that go like this. Thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. And one day God said, okay, I'm answering those, those prayers God made a covenant, if you, if you read 2 Samuel chapter 7 with David, that one day he would, he would send a, a, a prodigy of his seed, the Messiah, to rule and reign and sit upon the throne in Jerusalem. And so God, God honors the promise to Israel and to David. And, and at the end of the thousand years, God makes a new heaven, a new earth. And so there is this amazing millennial reign that is described in Revelation chapter 20. 
And it's a powerful thing that, that, that we all look forward to where there'll be a, a time of peace, there'll be a time of, uh, of, of health, there'll be a time where, where the, the, the ecological system, where, where aging will not be the way it is today. You know, I, I ran into a friend recently, and, and I'm getting older. I've got 13 grandkids, and he's getting older. He's got grandkids. And he looked at me and says, you know what, John? We're probably close to the same age. And he goes, there's only one thing good about getting old. And I'm, I'm looking at him thinking, what the heck is that? <laughs> he goes, grandkids. I go, well, you're kind of right about that. That's, about the, only, that's the only thing. <laughs> Trust me, I was talking to a guy in, in, the, in the aisle this morning about cataract surgery, and his wife walked up and goes, a couple old guys talking about cataract surgery. I said, you want to talk about colonoscopies? She goes, <laughs> Anyway, I, I'm digressing pretty far. There'll be, no, there'll be none of those. God made a covenant with Israel, and, and God will restore the earth. It'll be a marvelous time. And I want to just close with a, with a couple of questions. One for, for those who claim to follow Christ. And, and then secondly, a question for those perhaps who, who never have or who, who are struggling or, or, or who's honest and says, you know, I have spiritual thoughts, I'm a good person, but I really don't follow Jesus. I want to ask a question to those two groups. My first question would be to those who follow Jesus. And the question would be this. What is your relationship like with the Lord? What, what is your, your following all about? When Jesus gave his longest sermon, maybe his most poignant sermon of all, which we would call the Sermon on the Mount, he kind of made this statement. He said, most people make everything about themselves, and this is a paraphrase. Most people make everything about themselves. They worry about self all the time. They seek their own pleasure, their own kingdom, and so, so, so he said, you seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these will be added to you. So, so the question is, is it all about you? Is it all about your stuff, your money, your trips, your kingdom? Or is he king? Is he Lord? Is he the one that you're waiting for and realize that, that everything that we, we, we touch and pass through in this life is very temporal? So, so, so the question to those of us here who are following Jesus, and this is a question I'm asking myself, is it his kingdom? Is he king and Lord or are or, or you? Yeah, that's something to think about. That's something to, to, to pray about. And, and then the question to those who perhaps don't know for sure if they're a Christian or not following Jesus, uh, I first would say he wants a relationship with you. He wants to be your Savior, your Lord, and eventually join him on an earthly kingdom and a heavenly one. C.S. Lewis once put it like this. He said, I, I find within myself a desire which no experience in this life or world seem to satisfy. The most probable explanation of it, C.S. Lewis says, is that I was made for a different world and that God has put eternity in our hearts, a different purpose in life than just living for that which is temporal, looking for something that's more lasting. And the question is this to those who here who probably who, who may not know for sure is, will you be a part of his kingdom? Will you be a part of that first resurrection? And I think that's the question the Lord would, would ask. To those who are believers, what's your relationship really like? And to those who aren't sure or who maybe have fallen away and drifted away, will you be a part of his kingdom?